Hi everyone, you're all very welcome to, to our special In Conversation event with photojournalist Ivor Prickett. Uh, it's our first In Conversation event here in the gallery for quite some time, so we're delighted to have you with us. Uh, it's also the first event that we are live streaming to YouTube, so hello to everyone watching there. Uh, this event is part of our programming for pre Picte Hope, which is the current exhibition here in the gallery. Hello. Let's take a seat there. So we're always delighted to have the, the pre-picked here in Dublin. Uh, it's, it's one of the world's leading photographer prizes, prizes and it, it's, it's dedicated to issues of sustainability and the environment. Uh, before we get started, I'd actually like to just thank our funders, as usual, the Arts Council and Dublin City Council, and also to Candlestar, who make it possible for us to host the pre picked here in Dublin. Uh, and it's actually this year we were especially delighted to have it because there are not one but two uh, Irish nominees for the prize, Ivor being one and the other is Ross MacDonald. And we'll actually be hosting a book launch with Ross uh, later in the month. So I'll let you know a bit more about that afterwards. So just to introduce Ivor. Uh, Ivor has a degree in documentary photography from the University of Wales in uh, Newport. His early projects focused on displaced people throughout the Caucasus and the Balkans. Uh, he's been based in the Middle East since 2009 and he's do he documented the Arab Spring uprisings in Libya and Egypt. Uh, between 2012 and 2015 he documented the Syrian refugee crisis working in collaboration with UN Refugee Agency. Uh, his recent work has focused on the fight against ISIS in Iraq and Syria and he did that work exclusively on commission for the New York Times. Uh, Ivor has been recognised through a number of prestigious awards including the World Press Photo Pulitzer Prizes Overseas Press Club Awards, Picture of the Year International, Foam Talent, Taylor Weston Portrait Prize, and the Ian Parry Scholarship. Uh, most recently, his, his project End of the Caliphate was shortlisted for the pre picked out, and that's what we're going to talk about this evening. So, Ivor, thanks very much for joining us. You're very welcome. Thanks for having uh, me. Yeah, so I, I thought we would start by uh, talking a bit about your background, how you became in interested in photojournalism and decided to pursue it as a career. Uh, when we were talking earlier, you mentioned that you did your very first photography course here in the gallery. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I was trying to think exactly when it was. I think it was around 2001, 2002 probably. Okay. When I was in my uh, final years of school, probably my like fifth year of school in um, King's Hospital. And um, yeah, I, I was interested in photography, but I didn't really know what I was doing at that point. And I did a like a short um, black and white photography course here mm -hmm. at the gallery. And that was when I really kind of fell in love with photography and decided from that point on that I wanted to be a photographer mm -hmm. and focused on trying to build a portfolio to get into college so I could study. Um, and, and then, yeah, ultimately ended up at Newport mm -hmm. where I did documentary photography. Um, but, you know, it wasn't until I'd started at Newport um, and started to learn more about documentary that I became interested in photojournalism specifically and realized that I wanted to do, you know, news photography and, and, and work on, on stories related to um, breaking news and, and uh, geopolitics and conflict. Um, and I don't, <laughs> like, I, I think about it or I've been asked about it before and I'm not entirely sure how that happened, but I think it was just when I, when I started studying and was being introduced to the history of photojournalism, the yeah. documentary, that's what I was drawn to and that's what I, I kind of um, uh, felt somehow um, uh, was, was what I wanted to do and I just slowly started to pursue it. But of course it was a slow burn, a slow progression, yeah. you know, and it took me a long time to end up doing this kind of work. Um, and in the beginning it was uh, mostly like you said, like you mentioned, to do with um, uh, post-conflict related issues in the Balkans. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask you. From, like, from your earliest projects, you seem to have focused on the aftermath yeah. of conflict rather than the actual uh, events of war themselves. Yeah. The cliches, notion of photojournalism. Yeah, exactly. Mainly because I was too scared to actually go to a, an, act, you know, an ongoing conflict when I was that young. Okay. But um, I was also, yeah, I was very interested in the you know and it, it's still the case even with with this kind of work where i am working in an actual active conflict 
and still mainly interested in the humanitarian consequences of conflict and that is often best explored in the aftermath mm -hmm. not at the time sure. um, but I've done both now and, and um, you know even when I'm doing this kind of work I'm employing a lot of the uh, things I learned from doing those slower projects and like more investigative projects when I was younger um, so yeah that's a very brief summary of how it, how it started and there's a lot in between but so so for this particular body of work then end of the caliphate where were you where were you based primarily yeah so uh this uh, this work and the work you know in the book is all from iraq and syria mm -hmm. uh, made between 2016 and 2018 um during the kind of you know most critical moments in the in the fight against ISIS sure. um, you know the fight to reclaim these parts of Iraq and Syria that ISIS had taken control of um, and and the aftermath also you know like the latter half of the book uh, is, is about the aftermath and the rebuilding sure. of, of those places that were heavily destroyed during the during the conflict and so um, yeah the majority of the uh, of the book is um, made during the the, the actual um, operations and the, and the fighting that was going on and then um, let's say the last third is, is is the aftermath because although I ended up you know and I still work in the region I still work in Iraq and Syria now and there's still ongoing issues sure. related to that period you know camps refugee camps detainment camps with uh, tens of thousands of people who were caught up in, 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 the, in, the, in the fighting, uh, massive destruction. I, I'm still documenting that, but of course with a book, you've got a deadline and like things have to end at a certain point. So it only goes to, you know, the summer of 2018 basically. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where, where it was based. So I mentioned at the start, you, for this work, you were working exclusively for the New York Times on commission. Yes. So what sort of relationships did you have with them and sort of how important was that for you in making the work? Yeah, it was hugely important because um, actually in the beginning when I first started covering um, the, the battle for Mosul, mm -hmm. I was essentially on my own freelancing and I was there in the beginning for about two months already yeah. where, where, where I was, yeah, like I said, I was freelancing and, and working for different organizations and magazines and stuff um, and just trying to find a way to cover this story that I, I felt was really important. Um, and in the beginning uh, was mainly covering the humanitarian fallout from it because there were you know, hundreds of thousands of people trapped inside Mosul and they were fleeing as the, the fighting was, was going on. And then um, you know, after those first couple of months, I built up a body of work yeah. that started to say something and, and you know, um, come to get, was, was coming together. And I pitched it to the New York Times um, and, and that's when the relationship with them started because they picked that story up and actually then put me back on assignment for them to fill it out and, and, and uh, produce the first piece that I did for them. And, and then I, you know, the rest of the, the time I spent covering that story was always on assignment for them because they just kept me on the story and kept uh, uh, sending me back on assignment. But, you know, it started out... Um, with me, you know, kind of driving it myself, and even when when they were assigning me, yeah. it, it it was it were, they were my ideas, and it was me kind of um, using my contacts yeah. and um, uh, knowledge of the situation on the ground. But having them uh, support you um, made a huge difference because. I went from like being, you know, on my own and kind of worrying about budget uh, to having an amazing team of people around me, like, you know, really good fixers, yeah. translators, and um, just the name of the, of the New York Times, which opened doors and ultimately like helped me get the access. Yeah. The access was everything. Um, and then, you know, also, um, if anything went wrong, uh, you knew you had 
uh, this massive organization behind you, which allows you to push things a little bit okay. more, right? And so um, I definitely up the ante a bit after I started working okay. for them or I was able to because of everything. And yeah, it was, you know, it was, it was key for sure. Uh, and then of course it's an amazing platform and um, millions of people read the New York Times and get to see that work. And yeah. so that spurs you on as well, knowing that. Whereas if you're, you know, you're just doing your own work or you're working for a lesser publication, mm -hmm. uh, you can get, you know, you can get pretty disillusioned thinking, oh, no one's going to see this anyway. Yeah. And you're seeing really critical stuff and you feel like it's a really important story, but you're, um, you're not really getting it out there. But with them, uh, you know, no matter what you do, it's going to be seen. So as an audience, yeah, it's a lot of pressure, but it's also uh, a great motivation. Okay. Yeah. The the other thing I wanted to ask you about was the sort of day to day process of making work like this, because looking at it from an outside perspective, it seems like a very you're in very chaotic situations, very difficult situations. Mm -hmm. So I, I, maybe you could tell us a bit about how you sort of navigate that mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, you know find these stories. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was different at different times, of course, but during the, you know, when the fighting was going on in, uh, in both Mosul and, and Raqqa, mm -hmm. you were only able to be there if you were embedded with the military force that was, um, uh, you know, conducting operations yeah. on the ground. So you were, you were, yeah, you were embedded um, with the military and in, in Iraq, that was with the uh, I was mainly with the um, Iraqi special forces who were backed by the Americans yeah. and were the kind of spearhead of the attack, let's say, and doing all of the critical fighting. Um, and so, yeah, you would <clears throat> you would go into your to the outskirts of Mosul, let's say, um, and and link up with them in their in their rear bases mm -hmm. and be assigned to a unit. Yeah. And then you would leave, you know, kind of civilian life behind and then just be folded into their unit and, and, and follow them wherever they went. Mm -hmm. um, of course, they would, you know, they would take care of you and keep you a little bit back from the very front line. But really, like you could get as much in the thick of it as you wanted to um, because it's Iraq. It's, you know, it's a different it's a different kind of world to anywhere else so it was like okay you want to come you want to come to you know the front line sure you're welcome and um uh yeah that was it so you would yeah you would be uh rolling with them as they were um pushing into uh the territory that was still controlled by isis um and um they were you know they were supported by the americans and the coalition in the sky who were bombing in front and then they were going in and kind of clearing that was basically uh how it would work yeah um and i was yeah i was trying to document uh, uh civilians you know the civilian uh, casualties that were yeah. were uh, happening as a result of the fighting because they were caught in the middle um the destruction uh, the day-to-day -day life of the soldiers, mm -hmm. um, the fighting, um, and yeah, days would sometimes be incredibly long um, because you know you just you never knew what was what was going to happen, uh, and some days were incredibly boring because they would just be sitting around waiting for orders, and you would you know you would just have to um, bide your time. Um, but it was, no, it was incredibly grueling, incredibly dangerous. Um, but uh, I felt very important to be there, mainly because, uh, mainly because of the civilian uh, aspect in, in Mosul in particular, because there were, um, yeah, I mean, in the beginning, hundreds of thousands of people caught in the city still yeah. under, under the control of ISIS. And then you had this, like, um, mass array of uh, Iraqi forces who were pushing in yeah. to, to retake it and they were essentially caught in the middle so everyone knew that it was going to be this humanitarian disaster um, and I felt you know that it was really important to be there at the you know at the front line to, to really see what the cost was because 
I, I'd done it the other way around in the beginning and just photographed people as they were coming out and meeting them in the camps after yeah. they had fled. And they were the lucky ones, you know, who had managed to get out. But there were, you know, thousands of them. The estimates are 10, you know, 10 or 12,000 people were okay. killed in Mosul. And so they were the stories you didn't hear about, you know, and, and they were just, they were killed, you know, in airstrikes conducted by the, the Americans and the coalition. Yeah. And uh, if we weren't there, uh, and it's, it wasn't just me, there was, you know, there was a bunch of my colleagues there as well, sifting through the rubble and, and looking for these stories, you know, we wouldn't have known that sort of stuff. So that's why I was there. I wasn't really there um, for the, the gung-ho uh, nature of it. Um, yeah, so that, was, that was basically how it worked. In, during the fight, yeah. yeah. Do you, do you think being embedded with forces like that changes your perspective in the sense that you're you're only seeing things from one point of view, from the point of view of people uh, fighting against somebody? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it limits what you can see for sure. Uh, like in any conflict, because mm -hmm. you're going to have to choose your side. Probably, you're not going to be able to move. I mean, in some cases, you can um, uh, move between both sides of the front line and document. Um, uh, both sides but uh, with this it was impossible because obviously you know you couldn't you couldn't just walk up to ISIS and be like hey do you mind if I hang out with you guys for a while mm -hmm. um, um, so uh, that in that sense it was limiting but at the same time <laughs> I'm sorry we have some <laughs> music in the company but that's out I'm really expecting that that's nice Sorry, sorry about the interruption. <laughs> sorry. Um, no, but um, then, yeah. I mean, the other the other issue uh, being embedded with with any sort of military force is that they're usually quite sensitive about what you're seeing and what sure. you're allowed to document. You know, especially with Western military forces. Okay. Um, I've never really, I've actually never really done any sort of embeds with. Uh, uh, American or British okay. forces, but I know from my colleagues that there are some of the most restricted in the sense that, like, you will sign a disclaimer to say that you um, won't, you know, you won't show the dead bodies of their soldiers, right? right? Stuff like that. But with the Iraqis, really, there was there was no limits. You okay. know, the only times they got a little bit touchy with you being there was when they were. Um, uh, when they came across um, uh, ISIS captives who were still alive, you know, like ISIS militants who were still alive, mm -hmm. because 99% um, of the time what they wanted to do and what did happen was they would execute them on the spot. Okay. And so they didn't obviously want you to see that because they were smart enough at least to know that that was a war crime. Sure. And so uh, they would try and, yeah, they would try and stop you from from being, you know, in the vicinity when, when that was going on. Um, but aside from that, they, you know, they really didn't put up any barriers. Um, and it was pretty incredible access. And um, I mean, that's partly why it was a unique story to cover was because okay. you could get such um, frontline access. Mm -hmm. Um, it had been it had been a while, I think, since people had had that sort of access okay. to a conflict. You know, even um, in Afghanistan and Iraq before uh, the the fighting was it was very different. This was like urban uh, warfare yeah. that you could have 